record and we are recording. Yeah, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, call the Finance Committee meeting of November 8th, 2022 to order at three minutes after 3 p.m. and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, first uh, just say that uh, pursuant to uh, Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 as amended, this meeting is being held uh, by a rem remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is being permitted, but every effort is being made to assure that all members of the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means, and this meeting is being recorded. Um, so um, I want to make everybody aware that it's recorded and that the recording will be available for people who are interested in seeing it at a later time. Um, next thing I'd like to do is uh, call on each member of the committee and ask that they uh, uh, can hear me and we can confirm that we're hearing them. And once we've done that, then we'll uh, bring in uh, um, our guests to the process by uh, introducing them and uh, the other staff who are here for the first part of the discussion that we're going to have today. We're going to start with the street acceptance uh, for um, about 30 minutes is the uh, time that I've been anticipating. Uh, and. Uh, they have some specific goals I'll speak to in that in a moment. But going for uh, the confirmation that people can hear and be heard, uh, I'll just do it alphabetically by last name. So, uh, in Griesmer? Present. Egner? Present. Holloway? Present. Kubiak? Present. Uh, Miller? Present. Shane? Here. And I think that Walker is uh, currently not present. So um, with that said, um, I think that there are two people who are representing the um, community association. Um, one is Doug Donnell. Um, and uh, so Doug obviously could hear because we just saw him wave. And um, attorney Felicity Hardy. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. For some reason, my video is not working. Can everybody hear me? We yes. can hear you. Um, can you see us or is the video blocked both ways? Um, no, I can see everybody. Um, when I came into the meeting, uh, I got a notice in Zoom that I was in a practice mode or I don't know, some kind of strange, strange Zoom uh, message. Uh, as long as I can be heard, that's fine. I just, I didn't know whether or not, because I'm a visitor, um, I had some, you know, uh, some different status. Athena, is there anything that uh, Sean can do? I don't, I don't think so. Um, Felicity, do you have a camera? Did you say you have a camera? I do have a camera and it always works. So is the, um, is the, uh, is it a, like a laptop eye or a, uh, a portable Ooh. camera? Um, it's part built into the laptop. It, sometimes they're not open. You have to like scroll, you know, if it's um, open. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like it's fine. And it, it, Zoom is saying that I'm on video. So yeah, it's, no, it, it doesn't. It may it, just unless... be that my laptop is old and is being finicky. Okay. So yeah, as long as yeah, I can we be can, heard, I'm fine. We can hear you fine and it's nothing on our end. Okay. Okay, so... Um... That's it. The others um, present is uh, Christine Brest, who's the uh, planning department from the planning department, and Guilford Mooring, who's here from DPW. And uh, then um, we have Sonia uh, Aldrich and uh, Sean, who are from the finance department. Uh, so those are the uh, uh, who's present. What I wanted to do was kind of, um, and I, um, I don't see Paul yet. I, do we know if Paul's joining us? 
Yeah, he will be here around 3.30. I don't think he'll be here for this agenda item, but he'll be here for the next okay, one. Okay, so, because um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we had an opportunity to um, bring the committee up to date. And there was a lot of work that I've done in trying to um, get a better understanding of the background of what happened. Of, of the sequence of things that has happened. And I put, um, had some things that were added to the packet for today's meetings. And I welcome um, Doug and Felicity um, being able to contribute what they want to contribute as we go through and trying to get an understanding that that is what the primary goal is, is to bring everybody up to date on um, a series of things that have happened I think we talked a little bit last time about the origins of when the uh, subdivision was approved, but uh, the question of how the um, discussions have gone with the punch list, the role of the planning board had and the recommendation that the planning board had um, uh, out of their meeting, which um, Chris can tell us about, um, but it's also in the packet because her memo to the planning board um, is in the packet for this meeting. Um, and then um, the efforts that the Neighborhood Association did to try and pair the punch list with um, actual costs. And Doug might be able to help us out or Felicity in sort of introducing that a little bit. But really the goal is we want to establish an understanding and then see where we are in a process going forward so we can actually get to the end result that I think everybody is interested in um, uh, doing so. That, but it is a, it, this is a step that we just to keep this moving along and um, uh, my last comment is for um, one member of the committee has sort of had the question of why the finance committee, and I think we'll probably touch on that a little bit too, is, other than the obvious that that's what the council did was they referred it to us. But beyond that, there were, I think that there are legitimate questions as to where the financial piece falls in. So any any questions about uh, what we're trying to do? Right? Alicia's in the audience. Could you bring her in, please? Good. Can, you, can you do that, or do you need to make me co-host? I think Sean might. Okay. Oh, Sean got it. Good. Thanks, Sean. Alicia, hi. Good afternoon. Uh, can you just confirm that uh, we can hear uh, you? Can hear us? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So what we're doing today is we're going to start out for about thirty minutes talking about uh, street acceptance for Hopbrook and Kestrel Lane, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time uh, following up on the financial indicators uh, discussion, and then the first part of um, trying to get us towards uh, council guidelines for the budget, which are the next piece is after that. So um, back to uh, Upper and Kestrel. Um, we uh, last time had uh, sort of the background of the development of the, pro uh, of the project and um, that it um, came stuck along the way um, and uh, would um, Sean you know the or, or Sean you know the amount of money that's in the account that was deposited uh, from the uh, property that was sold it was do you have that amount it was around 20 something. Yeah, Chris may know it better. There's some amount in escrow around 20,000 or so, but um, Chris, I don't know if you have that number off hand. Chris has her hand raised. Yeah, Chris. 
Um, the last time I checked or the last time I was informed about this, we had 23,000. The original uh, deposit was 20,000 and it's gained um, interest over time. So it's around 23,000 at this time and it's being held in escrow by the town. So that's the amount. And the, when it was originally set up, the thought was there was going to be more money in the account but somewhere along the way with the original uh, developer uh, uh, passing away when he did and the transfer to Tofino, uh, additional amounts were not collected or added to the account. So that's part of the problem that exists there. And uh, it's my understanding and Doug or Felicity may know, uh, contribute to this one, or know that there was a, an amount that was to be paid by uh, the developer as each lot was sold. And then uh, somehow that that did not happen and uh, kind of stuck there. Felicity. So uh, what happened was that towards the, uh, once the subdivision was built, the planning board, um, established a bond for the developer to post. And as lots were sold, the bond would be reduced over time. Um, but apparently what happened was that the full bond was never posted with the planning board. Uh, Doug can correct me if my memory is wrong about this, but I believe the full amount was supposed to be $120,000, not $20,000. So the developer was about $100,000 short of what should have been posted. And had that happened, there would have been adequate funds to ensure that the developer finished the punch list and the roads would have been accepted in the ordinary course. But that never happened. Doug, do you have anything to add? And then Chris, I'll ask. Uh, I just, I, in this moment, I'll just add it. I believe the number was actually 130,000. That was what the board originally, the planning board originally voted. And I think that was in uh, 2001. Um, and then the other point, just to clarify that you had said, uh, Mr. Chairman, about um, when Doug Cole died in 2010, he was Tofino and then, but Tofino continued on. They, I don't know how they rearranged their business, but they did continue on. Um, and we've, we've been trying to get the road. We've been pursuing Tofino since around 2012. So e even though Doug did die and that was, that was definitely a, a problem at the time, it, it, there's a lot of time has gone by since then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and Chris. So I just wanted to clarify, I, I don't think it was a, actually an actual bond. The practice of the town has been that after the roadway is built, you know, more or less, <clears throat> except for the top coat, um, and we allow up to about half of the lots to be um, mm -hmm. sold, then when we reach the 50% mark, we start collecting escrow money. And so in this case, um, the plan was to collect escrow money on the last 13 lots. And that's where the 130,000 comes from. It was 10,000 per lot that the town should have collected every time they were asked to release a lot, but they didn't do that for whatever reason. I wasn't working with the planning board at that time. So that was the amount. And, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really a bond. It was, you know, take the money from the developer, put it into an account in the town market that it was for this purpose and um, then move on. So, um, Doug, did you have something to add? Okay. Um, so then it's my understanding that uh, money was collected by Tofino Keep treating them as a corporation, not as the individual of Doug Hull. And uh, that money um, came from the sale of lots, but uh, the portion that was to be conveyed to the town did not get conveyed. 
after the first 30,000. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the idea is that the money is to ensure the performance of the developer's final obligations to finish the subdivision. That's what the money is for. You know, if Tofino had finished the roads and finished the punch list and everything was done and used its own money to do that, then the money that would help be held in escrow would be released. But as we say, that that, that did not occur. So that's helpful. So then it gets to the second question, and uh, that's where um, Guilford um, also can be helpful, is to where we are now with the identification of the punch list, uh, because the, that, that's the, sort of the second piece. Guilford? Do we, you're, you're muted now, or? So the punch list has been back and forth a few times, but I believe in your packet, you actually have the, the list. Um, do you need me to show it or? Do you think you have it, Lynn, or do you want Guilford to show it? I have it. Let's put it up and um, um, you have, and then uh, Guilford can confirm. Um, I think somebody needs to allow me to share. I keep getting that I've just host disabled participant screen sharing. So try it, try it again. Okay. Uh, there we go. Um, a punch list. Hold on. So that's the uh, right. I'm, I'm getting there. Well, you just had it. I did. Okay. Yeah, there. That's the punch list. And then we have the estimates for um, Topbrook and Castro. Right. So this is the, what we expect that needs, needs to be done for Kestrel. Um, it, um, it, it would, uh, if it was a normal, in the normal process, the road would be perfectly paved at this time, but we know it's a little older. So we're just saying uh, to crack seal the entire road, which is just a, a maintenance um, activity. It's sort of preservative. It's not, <clears throat> it's not a long-term fix. So it starts off with um, the crack seal for both the roads and there's trees and sidewalks and then you, you can read down through it. The only thing that um, number 13, the ADA sidewalks or ramps, those weren't required when the subdivision was built. That's something that's changed over time. So the punch list has all these items. And then if you look at the, you wanna scroll down Lynn to um, Kestrel, I mean to Hopbrook. If I can, yeah. scroll down. Hold on. And this is the list for Hopbrook. And again, it has crack seal the whole road. Um, and then I think the ADA is on there as well. No, I don't see it on here. So these are the, this is what the town engineer has walked through the development with the developer. And this is the list of everything that needs to be addressed. And then the estimate is from Warner Brothers um, of how much needs to, how much it would cost. So I can show the estimates. Do you want me to do that, Andy? Yes, I think that would be helpful. And then I, uh... See that Bernie's hand is up, but let... can you see the estimate now? This is for Hopbrook. Can you see it? Yes, I can. So this is the number at the bottom, which is the total, is actually the estimate for both roads from Warner Brothers. It's for Kestrel and Hopbrook, um, and some of the items are mixed together in the two estimates. So you have to see them kind of both, but 133 is what they're thinking. 
um, this was done back in 2021, and we're seeing we're seeing at least 15 to 20 percent increases in prices right now. So that number isn't exactly the number we would uh, use. So you're saying that in 2021. I'm sorry, I can't raise my hand and show screens. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, in 2021, the estimate for the total punch list, as it was understood to be at that time, was $133,415. Correct. And that this is only with sealant, not with the total resurfacing. Correct. And And that's both roads. It's both roads. And if you add and if you add some if you add for inflation, it's probably around two hundred thousand in today's cost. Right. Okay. And can you give us a sense of when you seal a road, what kind of life expectancy are you looking at in terms of having to finally repave it? It depends on the road, but most of the times you reseal it once, and then within five to ten years, you're you're paving it. I I have a quick question of Guilford. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the um, uh, when Warner Bros. did this, did, does this work encompass everything that's on the uh, town punch list? This does, yes. Okay, so we can use this as a proxy for the cost of of the punch list that Jason's prepared. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Excuse me. May I just interrupt? Jason told me that this punch list that was prepared as a cost estimate does not include crack sealing. That's what Jason told me. He said crack sealing is hard to figure out as an as an estimate. So this estimate does not include crack sealing, according to Jason. Can you scroll back up to the front page of the estimate, or to the? You seeing it now? No. So Jason, yeah, Jason's right. There's there's no crack ceiling on that. Warner Brothers also doesn't do that work. So do you have an estimate or not of what crack ceiling would add to that if it's not on the list. Um, I would actually say if you use the price for the the, the twenty seven hundred for the eighty eight ramps, you're probably pretty close to what the price would be. It's only it would probably be for those two roads anywhere from th twenty five to three thousand dollars. Okay. Um... I'm going to continue on with others who have uh, raised hands for a moment. Sean? Guilford, um, do these estimates, is this pretty much everything that was wrong with the road when it back then? Are these things that are, you know, were wrong at the time and would have had to be fixed at, as part of a punch list back in 2006? Or are some of these things, uh, things that have happened over time? I'm trying to get a sense of you know, if we if we had done our part back then, what would be the what would have been what are those items that we would have made sure were fixed before it was finalized, and what portion are things that have just wear and tear that's happened since then? A, a lot of the issues with the catch basins, um, the gutter inlets, uh, some of the settling around valves and so forth. The sinkhole was actually a problem before. Um, m most of this, except for probably the, in 2006, yeah, most of this, except the crack ceiling and the, um, most of it was issues that came up at that time as well. Okay. So it may make sense to leave crack ceiling off because that wouldn't necessarily have been an issue back then. That's something that's happened over time, right? It ha Yeah, it has. Okay. Doug, you can lump it all together into about twenty and about two hundred thousand dollars and probably everything. Doug, yeah, I just like to add uh, a couple things. Um, 
one, this estimate, I, I had this estimate put together as a homeowner uh, to do our due diligence two years ago. So this was generated um, because I took the time to walk the roads with Warner Brothers with the town engineer. Um, this list was based on the punch list that Jason had generated in 2020. And it was the state of the road in 2020. And it, we decided not to include the crack ceiling because the town or somebody other than Warner Brothers can get a much better cost per foot at the scale of a town. Um, but this also includes what was originally part of the, there was three, depending on who you ask, three to five items on the original punch list in 2006, 2004 to 2006, that were not complete at the time when the road would have been accepted, but they are also included in this. Um, So just, I just want to kind of clarify that, that there was the original outstanding items, as well as some items that need to be cleaned up on the as built, which are the surveys for the two roads in 2004. Those, those items are also on this list, but then in addition to those three or five items, depending on who you ask, there are these additional 37, say, items uh, that are a result mostly of just time going by. Um, no, no, there were other issues. There were some issues at the time, and the list, the short list of three, was um, was sort of a compromise list that was brought together. If you want to know everything, many of these issues were going on in two thousand six as well. So. Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I think I'm hammering, I'm following up on the same theme um, that what wasn't done when it should be done and our best guess at the estimate of it versus what has happened since whatever was supposed to be done originally didn't happen. And I, Chris, I, I think that was part of a discussion at the planning board also. Um, you know, that if some of this has developed over time, that's less the developer's fault. Although if the developer didn't do what they were supposed to do at the outset, it contributed to more rapid deterioration or related problems. And I'm, I'm just looking for of the 200,000, how much we think the developer should still be on the hook for. And I realize you've been trying to get it forever. And how much, if everything had been up to snuff and the town had taken it over, we would have been since 2006 doing some work on these roads, Guilford, although some roads in town probably haven't been touched since 2006 that had nothing to do with this development, um, given this uh, You know, I'm just trying to sort the 200,000 out on um, negligence um, at the original failure to perform at the original. And, and that 23,000, Chris, all of that can be used toward this uh, 200,000-ish, right? Correct? So. You want me to answer that, Andy? Yes, go ahead, please. Chris. Yeah, the 23,000 is available. And um, Tofino has also committed to doing three items that are listed on a short list. And the estimate for that is somewhere between 20,000 and 25,000. So if you add, you know, 20,000 that he's committed to do and 23,000 that he's got in our account, that's 43,000. So he's more or less committed to do about $43,000 worth of work. And may I just say one more thing? Yeah. I don't think that the planning board got clarity on what things were needing to be done in 2004 versus what things need to be done now. I don't think there's any clarity about that. So no, nobody has that information as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so let me, Lynn. I guess one of the issues that I have 
with the fact that the money isn't there. Yes, the town can accept some responsibility because we didn't pursue, although maybe we did. But anybody who knows that there is a commitment should be putting money aside, even if they didn't get a bill from the town. So the fact that we're now looking at what should have been $130,000 when all the lots were sold, even if the town didn't bill, the um, developer knew very well that that was the commitment. So I'm a little annoyed <laughs> that we keep feeling like this is a town fault. I, I'm not annoyed, I'm just perplexed that this should be seen as a town problem because we didn't bill. Um, versus a, own, a developer problem because they didn't put the money aside. Because to me, the whole issue goes back to where is the $130,000 that should have been collected? And that's the amount of money, whether it should have been collected and it was someplace and in escrow and you know earning some interest or not but if the question before us and this is to me this is why this is in the finance committee is if we you know pass a motion or something to have the town manager negotiate this so that we can accept the road are we basically sending him to the negotiation table and saying up front you know we the town are willing to except $90,000 plus in debt in order to accept this road. And I have a serious problem with that. And it's, at, I, my, my heart goes out to these, these residents. I, I'm just very questioning the ethical nature of the developer. Bernie? My question is just, Tofino, we have $23,000 out of 133. So does Tofino still owe us uh, $110,000, $113,000 because those lots have never been released from escrow? This is one of the reasons why I think I said last time that we need to have town attorney consult on this because we may be able to recover this money but we don't know that. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I uh, Attorney Hardy, I, I appreciate that your hand is up, but um, if we end up in court, it, it ain't gonna be you representing the town, sorry. Um, you know, and the question I had is, is how is this communicated to the developer? You know, was, is there a process in place back in 2004 that released the lots from escrow um, or not? And, uh, you, you know, that um, uh, what was communicated to the developers is, uh, is, is to me is important, but it seems to me that the developer still owes us his money if, if they were supposed to put the lots in escrow and never did. Sean? Yeah, so uh, two things. I think, you know, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I will say I do think the town does bear some of this responsibility. Um, Gilbert, I don't know if you have a guesstimate, but if if these things were done back in 2006 or 2007, they probably would cost a lot less than $130,000 if that's what they cost in 2001, right? We're probably half as much, maybe. Um, it would cost less. Um, prices prices started to go up around 2007. Okay. Maybe. So, so I think here in the conversation, it is a complicated issue. Um, staff have discussed this. I've talked with the town manager. I've talked with um, Dave Zomack and Guilford and Christine. Um, you know, our recommendation is to uh, ask the town manager to negotiate with Tofino and the residents and reach some sort of um, mutually acceptable agreement uh, to move this process forward. Because I think there's a lot of unknowns, and, and until we kind of empower the town manager to to see what's possible, um, we're not going to get those answers and see see what is possible. So that. 
that's the recommendation that we have um, to move this issue forward. Which I think makes sense. And I'm going to come back to it in just a second. I want to hear from Kathy and Michelle about their questions. And then, because I think that you're, uh, Sean, I appreciate you bringing that up because it is where I wanted to get to in a moment. But Kathy, did you have a question? No, I just want to build if we're sending the town manager in to negotiate. He's not a mediator. He's negotiated on behalf of the town, not just to see if the two parties. I'd send him in with a bottom line number or at least a range. And um, we're being offered additional, Chris said, an additional 20 to 25 into the 23. If I go back to what we were owed, that was what Bernie was talking about. We would have had hundred, another 110 sitting in escrow. And uh, we've got a price tag of 200,000. So I think we should should not settle for anything less than 100, you know, so go up on his offer from from where it is now and whatever leverage we have on it or anything less than 110. So I, I just feel like there it it sends an unfortunate signal um, that if if you if for a variety of reasons, you wait long enough, the town will just take it over. Um, so hopefully we also have a case study that this would never happen again, but I just, I would like to send him in with the finance committee saying, uh, we're starting at an offer of 25 in addition to the 23 we've got or 20, whatever that number is, Chris, and get it up. Um, that's where I would, the, the terribly worded recommendation I would make in terms of um, of what I'd like to send him in with, but that's the sense of it. Michelle? Thanks. Uh, I just wanna make sure I understand. So what Lynn was saying, I think, is that there was supposed to be money set aside that should have been put in escrow and some agreement between the town and the developer. Um, I, I don't know of any <clears throat> legal reason why we would have to bill a developer for them to be uh, in, uh, you know, to 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 fulfill their agreement. So I'm just trying to understand it sounds like that money got lost track of, but why is that not money that we can still pursue um, if there is an agreement in place that says that that money is owed to the town? Yeah, Felicity, I don't know. If... So a couple of things, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I would just suggest to the committee that um, establishing um, a negotiating posture in a public meeting might not be the most prudent approach. So I would just uh, encourage everybody to think about that. Um, so that was one thing I was going to say. And to Ms. Miller's point, the way it works, Ms. Miller, is that when a developer does a, a subdivision project, the uh, lots are released for sale over a period of time, okay? And generally speaking, the money that's set aside in escrow is, a, a, I called it a bond earlier, that's probably not the best use of the word, but the idea is it's a, it's a way to make sure that the developer finishes what they're supposed to do. In this case, apparently what happened was that the, the first couple of payments were made. And then after that, perhaps after Doug passed away, a process was begun where the lots in the Meadow subdivision were released from the um, from the um, restraints that the town had put on it without Mr. without uh, Mr. Parker or Tofino putting up the additional money as time went on. So it's not really that the town is owed the money. What the town is owed is the performance, but the escrow is there to make sure he gets it done. And thank you. That's really helpful. If I could just ask a follow-up, Andy, if that's okay. Sure. 
Um, so there wasn't any sort of lien or anything that was there that protected. So basically the escrow was set up between the developer and the, and the neighborhood, not the developer. No, 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 no. It's, it's a, it's a responsibility between the planning board and which approved the subdivision and the developer. Okay, and the way it's supposed to work, there's Chris can correct me because historically I wasn't involved in this matter, but typically what will happen is there's a there's a restriction. It's called a covenant, a subdivision covenant. Okay, and all of the lots are subject to that covenant, and that covenant prevents the developer from selling the lots. Okay, without getting a release from the planning board. And in this case, what was supposed to happen was that every time the developer went to sell a lot, they would put another $10,000 in escrow to make sure that the, sub the subdivision rows got finished. That's what, that was where things broke down. Okay. It's not like build or anything like that. What happens is that the developer says to the planning board, hey, planning board, it's time for me to sell, you know, a lot. I'm ready to sell it. Please release that lot from this covenant. And in exchange, I'll give you the $10,000 to ensure the performance okay. of the roads. Okay. And we can't retroactively act on that covenant? No. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm going to um, recognize Chris and then I'm we want to take a pause to try and pay, get our path forward. And uh, I recognize that I, I know that Bernie and Doug have hands up too. Um, Chris, you will read. So this is kind of a follow up to what Felicity just said. And I don't think that the town has a stick to use to get the developer to pay the money or to finish the road at this time because all the lots have been released. So in my mind, the mechanism to get the developer to pay more is either to negotiate with him and then in good faith, since he does work in the town of Amherst and wants to be in good graces with the town, he may choose to negotiate or the alternative would be to um, take him to court. And it seems that taking him to court is going to prolong the distress of the residents and may not eventually be successful and will cost the town money. So uh, we've already been talking about this since 2014. So I, I go along with the recommendation of the planning board, which was to um, authorize the town manager to negotiate a settlement and the town and the planning board also as an afterthought included the residents in this negotiation to see if the residents wanted to participate in having this road finished. So it could be just the town and Tofino who are negotiating, or it could be the town and Tofino and the residents who are negotiating to finish this road to come up with the money to to put this to rest. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. But you actually, there's one other thing, Chris, and that is that uh, what the planning board vote was was to suggest that the town council negotiate, which is why I think one of the things that was confusing to me. I think that was in error. Um, I think that, you know, I put this language together for the planning boards to choose from. There were four different choices that they could make. What I meant was when I put the wording together was that the town would negotiate and I mistakenly put the town council. So it really should be the town manager negotiating on the part of the town um, rather than the town council. But I think that was the intent of the planning board. And if you want me to go back and get them to re-vote this, I can do that. Well, it may not be necessary because I think um, as long as we can come to our recommendation, which I would think that uh, we do ask the town manager to negotiate on behalf of the town uh, council or council committee can effectively negotiate amongst other reasons for the point that uh, Felicity brought up that it would be doing so in public and uh, we that's not a 
a good way to negotiate is through a public process where you have to do things through open meetings. So uh, it would seem that the appropriate thing for us to do is to ask the town manager to take this on and then report back to us and put our work um, it, once we've concluded today on hold until we hear back from him. Uh, so, uh, Bernie? Yeah, a couple of points. Uh, from my experience, you, you can have a bond issued by the developer um, for per a performance bond issued, but that's not considered a best practice because if they, they don't finish the work, then you've got to go seize the bond and that's a whole, that's, a, that's problematic. My other experience is, is the escrow money gets collected up front and it gets returned to the developer as work proceeds. So that way you're sitting on their money and it's, it's an incentive. And I think uh, one lesson from this is we need to, and maybe all this has been fixed, I don't know. And, and I know that uh, uh, the planning department is certainly very busy, but it would be a good thing to go back and look at the process that we use to ensure that we get the money up front or that we have a more aggressive kind of policy for collecting the escrow money um, from, a, from a developer. Uh, the way this is headed is that, and again, I do wish that we had heard from uh, the town attorney. Uh, maybe we can't, and you know, it's probably not, attorney Hardy is correct. It's probably not a, it's not a good idea to come up with a negotiating strategy in, 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 in public. But I think the way we're headed is that we should, um, uh, we should suggest to the you know, have the town administrator, uh, the town manager, try to negotiate out the best settlement possible in this. Um, I don't mind the residents being included in those discussions, but just keep in mind that they're not negotiating on behalf of the town. Yeah, I was um, when Chris mentioned. She gave the planning board four options. I was reminded to go back and look at the memo that Chris sent. And um, I that is one of the four options. Obviously, we could also ignore this. We could do any number of things. Um, I just don't want to start setting a precedent where basically subdivisions don't get completed in terms of the roads and then because we care about our residents, the town's picking up the tab. And I said this in the last meeting and I'll, I'll just repeat it again. We don't need to be accepting any more bad roads in Amherst. We've had plenty. Um, and our residents tell us that every day. So I'm just very concerned. And I definitely do not wanna see us negotiating in public and I don't wanna see us even suggesting the strategy in public, but um, in my mind, you know, this isn't the town's fault. And yet we want to help our residents out. Doug? Yeah, I just, I just want to add that um, the, it, it's not that it's the town's fault, but the town is the governing body. And th this has been an approved subdivision since, two, I mean, the late 90s. And it has been the plan that this would be an accepted public way since that time. It was built to those standards. It almost happened in the early 2000s. And then it didn't. And primarily that's because Tofino has resisted that process for a decade and a half. However, the town also has certain responsibilities, whether that's financial or not, to oversee that those developers are, you know, that, that there, there was no statute of limitations of when this is getting done. And so the, the town never governed in that sense. And so now you have 28 property owners who are paying in property taxes under the expectation that they're living on a public way. And here we are 15 years later. And, you know, many of the problems that are associated with the costs of this are, are a function of time. 
And this would not have been the issue that it is today had it been more consistently pursued by both parties, the town and Tofino, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, even five years ago would have made a big difference. And, and I just wanna add that the homeowners have been pursuing this actively mm -hmm. as, as hard as we can in, with, with the limited agency that we have uh, for since 2014. Thank you. Joelford. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to point out there's only two subdivisions like this in Amherst right now. There's this one, the Meadows, and there's um, Amherst Hills. And I think Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but those are the only two subdivisions that haven't been finalized that were laid out as public roads. Um, all the rest have either been private roads or they've been completed. So these are the only two like this. We do have some private roads that have asked to be accepted as public roads, but there's no, no subdivision that still hasn't finished except for these two, the Meadows and Amherst Hills. Okay. Um, I don't think that there's much else we can do. I know that Paul has uh, is now at least listening in on the meeting because I see his, he's he's joined us. Say, hey, hey Paul. Uh, I think that what we're moving towards is uh, a suggestion that has been made uh, by Sean earlier, and I think that he had already dis uh, probably discussed it with you, which was that the committee asked that you take over and uh, uh, negotiate with Tofino and, as appropriate, the homeowners to see, um, to see if there's uh, a resolution that can be reached that will allow uh, a, uh, the the council to move forward with this with the acceptance process. And uh, would that be acceptable? Yeah, yes, that's our recommendation. And I think it's a good approach. Yeah. And. Uh, I think that the other thing that would be helpful for us to know uh, is that Chris had sent us a memorandum at the beginning when it was first presented to the council before referral to this committee. And uh, Chris's memo was really based upon KP Law's um, general advice to all of its uh, client communities that um, delineated a three-step process. And uh, the first step is to accept the um, layout of the roads um, that would uh, be proposed to be accepted uh, according to the plans that were developed. And I think that uh, we talked about that in our first meeting. Uh, and so it would be helpful to know whether there's any reason why we couldn't take that first step. And uh, if uh, uh, KP Law thinks that it would be appropriate to do so, I think that it would be uh, sort of uh, something for us to consider to indicate to the homeowners that we are taking this uh, matter up seriously. So that would be, um, if you could find that out, that would be helpful. I want to conclude this uh, um, so that we can get on to the, our other agenda items, but uh, see a couple of hands up uh, again. So, Michelle. Really quickly, um, Guilford, the two that you said have not, the two, the two developments that you just mentioned, are they the same developer? Yes. Okay. And the second one that you mentioned, that's not the one we're talking about, is that still, is there any protections that we need to put in place, given what we know about this developer? Um, or is that, where is, what's the status of that one? 
Uh, the, the planning department and the DPW is working with him and getting things corrected. And that one's actually moving differently than this one is. I see. Okay. Thank you. Good. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, um, go ahead. Then I move. Motion. I move that we ask the town manager manager to negotiate with Tofino, and to the extent um, that the residents can be involved, uh, to bring this to conclusion. That's the recommendation to the town council, correct? I'm sorry. I'm. That's right. We have that's to right. recommend that to the town council. Shane seconds. So it's a the motion is uh, to recommend to the town council that it asks the town manager to negotiate with Fino and Associates um, and uh, with uh, the homeowners uh, participating as appropriate to reach a resolution. Yeah. To this uh, problem. Uh, and Michelle? Are we in discussion of the motion now? Yes. Okay. Um, just building on what I was just asking Guilford about and understanding that we don't want to negotiate in a public meeting, I'm wondering if there's any benefit in having Paul try to uh, negotiate both of the situations together, if there's any leveraging uh, that could be had with that. I understand it sounds like that one's moving in a different direction, but is there any strategy, or I guess I just ask Paul uh, to consider that um, in his process. Chris? Um, on that one, um, we know what needs to be done, and the developer has given us a check for $50,000 to complete the work, which is more than Jason Skeels, the town engineer, thinks is necessary to complete the work. Jason estimated around $25,000, so we have $50,000 in our account, and um, I think that that project, um, which is Amherst Hills, is on the way to um, being satisfactorily completed as far as the town goes. There's an ongoing lawsuit between Tofino and the homeowners, which the town is not a party to, and we really don't know much about that. But I feel like that one is, is on its way to being concluded. So uh, we have a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Is there anything else to be said on, on the motion? So, uh, seeing none, I'm going to, uh, if there's no request for further discussion, just go ahead and uh, take a vote, which, um, because this is a remote meeting, just uh, so that uh, our guests understand what's going, why we're doing this this way. It's required to, uh, by the open meeting law that if there's a uh, remote meeting that we uh, take all votes uh, by uh, asking each member. And the other thing um, for a vote, and the other thing that uh, you should know is just that there are five voting members of the committee who are the councilor members of the committee, and there are three resident members who are non-voting members. And so when uh, we call on uh, each member, we are uh, uh, asking for a yes or no from councilor members. Uh, and uh, we also ask uh, our resident members whether they support it, it um, that um, or don't support the motion uh, that's reported in the minutes um, and reported to the council. <clears throat> but it's not, but the vote itself is, a, it has to be amongst, has to be a majority of the councilor members. Uh, so ready to vote, Lynn? Aye. Uh, 
Bob? I support. <clears throat> Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Michelle? Aye. Kathy? Yes. And I'm a yes. And then uh, Alicia? Yes. So the vote on that is uh, five to zero with uh, the three resident members in support. And uh, with that, I think that we're finished with this agenda item, unless anybody um, has any final thing that they would like to say. Otherwise, I think we need to get on to the uh, financial trend report and the beginning of the next process. Lynn. Yeah, the only thing I ask is that if there are other motions the council needs to take that's part of the three step process to please make sure I have them for the uh, meeting on the 21st of November. Um, but I think that what we had said was is that uh, the first step in the process is outlined by Chris was the definition of the roads and uh, that uh, we were going to, uh, I was suggesting that we not make a recommendation to the council unless we've heard from town council that they advise that we do that. Okay, thank you. So, um, I think that's kind of where we are unless there's disagreement. Yeah. Um, so with that, I want to very much say thank you to uh, Doug and Felicity and to Guilford and uh, Chris for your help with this discussion. It was um, very helpful for us so that we could uh, conclude things for right now with the finance committee. They come back to the finance committee when we have a report from Paul, he's ready to do so. But um, uh, so I want to thank you, Doug. I just want to express um, uh, thanks on behalf of all the homeowners on the Meadows Homeowners Association for the Finance Committee and the town staff for uh, hearing out our situation as thoroughly as you all have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, thank you both. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, anyway, uh, so we are going to be ready to move on to the next agenda item. And uh, so I want to thank those of you who joined us for the first agenda item. So uh, last night we had the financial um, indicators uh, report and I want to take a few minutes to see if there are further questions about the indicator report and the uh, uh, financial recommend the initial recommendation and then uh, at least start defining the issues that we need to talk about for the uh, guidelines so uh, it's really just opening for questions right now Kathy my first question is I would like to have a copy of the document. I just quickly looked in the packet, Sean. I didn't see it in the finance committee. Um, if if it was in the council, what I just missed it. Um, yeah, sorry. I, so I, it's I, I added it to the packet last night, but I didn't I didn't think to add it to the finance packet for today. But it is in the packet from last night. Okay. Um, so maybe Sean, you can pull it up. But just yep. when when. The very detailed table flew by. Um, I won't say you flo floated it by, but it was um, when you get to the back on the revenues. I didn't understand. Um, I wanted to understand on the local receipts. Sure. How you come up with and and this is the question I asked last night. If people weren't there, um, if you look back to FY twenty actual, we were at. Uh, almost 8 million, it dropped off, then went back. I don't know why it jumped up in 22. And then it went drop back in 23 budget. So I, I, I'm asking about that line, but more generally, 
we got the fourth quarter report for the year that we just completed and revenues were higher than we'd estimated and expenses were lower. And I didn't go back and double check whether receipts were part of that, Sean, you know, mm -hmm. in terms, you know, just so cross checking. So it's just this pattern on receipts. I don't completely understand um, a the fluctuation and whether this is an extremely conservative a number and you'd expect if the economy doesn't go belly up that it would come in better so that's that that's my one detailed question i have a couple others but this was more a picky one about the revenue side yeah and is it okay if i spend a little time going through this because i anticipate this question based on what kathy said last night so i think it might help if i just go through line by line and give some of the thinking and and you know what might change over time and and where there's conservatism and where there's uh, you know, where there's not. Is it okay if I take a little yes. bit of time, Andy? Okay. Um, so on your screen, so in general, as I said last night, local receipts, those are our mostly economic driven revenues. So they are the ones that will fluctuate the most when there's an economic downturn or there's an economic uh, boom. Uh, these are the areas where we will see uh, the most drastic changes because they're directly driven by activity here in downtown and, and throughout town. So, so just in general, keep that in the back of your mind that these are our, our revenues that vary the most. Um, so starting with motor vehicle excise tax. So we've budgeted 1.6 for now for FY24. Uh, that's an area that I could see potentially going up as we go through future versions of this. You can see in FY20 and 21, we brought in about 1.7. Uh, FY22 was an, an abnorm ad abnormally large year um, where you can see it came in much higher than the prior years. Um, one thing we did put in place recently that we hope will increase motor vehicle excise tax over time is the, the parking permit system where we are sort of incentivizing uh, residents downtown to actually garage their vehicles here and that would contribute to this number rising. So as we see the numbers come in in FY23, that's something we might bring up uh, as we go forward. Uh, the way motor vehicle excise tax works is there's usually a one or two large commitments um, that will make up the bulk of the number. And then you know we'll, we'll have some information to base that on because we can compare that to prior years to see if those commitments are larger than in past years. Again, this is a number that will go up if there's a lot of newer vehicles in town, they're, they're paying the higher motor vehicle excise fee. Um, we do have some concern because of the, uh, the sort of the difficulty and the lack of inventory for new vehicles that this that might push this number down in the future. That's one of the reasons why we're being conservative here is, you know, I'm just thinking about our town vehicles. We can't get vehicles right now, the ones that we need, um, you know, for at least six, nine months. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind here that that could influence this number to go down because there's less newer vehicles and the and the corresponding tax is a little bit lower. Uh, going um, to the Sean, can I just add something sure. to that? Yep. Um, if you if you look at the fourth quarter report and the detail on there, you'll see that three hundred and thirty two thousand dollars of this is from the previous year. So we're still collecting from the previous year too. If you look at what was actually collected for the um, current year in twenty two, it was one point six. So just kind of have to look at that too because sometimes there's lags coming in. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I'll just jump in here because I think this is really is one of those economic indicator um, lines because, you know, as people stop buying cars, if they feel tight, you know, then it, I think this is one we want to be conservative on if we can be. And, and so, just so people know, I wasn't being con critical of it. I do understand. I think this is the correct way to do a public budget. <laughs> yeah. And, and Kathy, I think your question is, this is the area that I think is worth the most time being spent on because this is what really kind of reflects our community here. So I, I think it was a great question and I'm glad we can go through these. Uh, so hotel, motel, meals, uh, you can see what we're pro uh, projecting for 24 is, is pretty consistent with what we brought in in 20 and 22. Uh, 21, that was again, where we had the big dip because of the pandemic and a lot of things were shut down. Um, this is a number that will keep bumping up when we see the numbers come in higher. Uh, so if we see really big numbers, you know, through the first couple quarters this year, that could go up a little bit, but I don't see that number changing much because it's pretty consistent with our experience. Uh, cannabis tax. So cannabis tax was high. You can see in 20 and 21, 
Uh, it dropped down in 22 when one of the dispensaries switched away from being a recreational dispensary. And I looked at the first quarter receipt for 23 and it's really low. Um, so I just don't know if there's a shift away from sort of recreational sales or if eventually the, the new recreational dispensaries in town will, will push this number back up. Um, but the cannabis tax number is actually one I, I think we might end up dropping if we don't see the second quarter uh, tax payments for can recreational cannabis sales come in. If, if that's not higher than um, than the first quarter, I think we'll end up having to drop that. Um, so that's one that might be a little bit too high at this point, um, but it reflects what we thought we were going to get based on 22. Um, penalties and interest. Uh, so that one, again, it's pretty consistent with what you see in 2021 20, um, and tw uh, what we have budget for 23. Uh, 22 had a, a really high, um, actually, I think Jen mentioned this last night, uh, we collected a, a lot of tax title uh, payments um, and the corresponding fees that go along with it. So there was a sort of a high, again, unusually large year in 22, um, but that's not typically where that number is. And so th those are the type of things we don't build into the budget. It's great when we get them and it helps um, build reserves, but they're not things that are we can rely on every year. Uh, pilot, we know exactly what that is every year. That's uh, right now the only thing in our pilot section are our payments from our enterprise funds for their property. So that's that number is a known number. Fees, so these are impact fees. The, the vast majority are cannabis in, uh, community host agreement fees. These revenues are restricted in their in their use. So when they come in, we hold them. They go into our reserves, and our plan is to recommend something to you later this year on how to use those, but they're not general revenues. That they're By law, they have to go into our general fund and go to free cash, but in terms of what they can be used on, it's not the same as other revenues where they can be used on anything, there's restrictions. Um, so we're coming up with a plan of what we think would make sense uh, for how to use these. And the new cannabis legislation that recently pa um, was passed will likely eliminate or all or most of this revenue is what we anticipate. Um, the rules that were in place when we first created the community host agreements have been changed significantly. And will again, it, it will result in reductions to this revenue source long-term. So um, this isn't a source, we, we show it here because it is a general fund revenue, but it's not something we uh, that supports our operating budget. Um, but you will hear more about that in the spring. Uh, rentals, this is for rental of town space. This number is pretty much a known number based on who our tenants are and what their rental agreements are. Departmental revenue. Uh, so those are things like the rec department and you know fire department, all those types of fees. So a couple things to note. You can see the number for FY24. It's consistent with 20 and 21. Again, 22 was a spike. I went in and looked at some of the variables that drove 22 to be higher than normal. Uh, one thing was about was $70,000 of uh, COVID relief money. That was when they were uh, giving municipalities money to help with the um, when staff were out and took the COVID leave. So that number had a $70,000 of money that was a one-time thing that we're not going to get every year. Um, there was another uh, something that we do periodically related to our liability funds, where if we over fund something, we release it. It's a, an accounting adjustment, but it results in these sort of temporary uh, increases in revenue in, in there. It's a uh, sort of an accounting maintenance account. So so that was a temporary thing. And then the last one was, oh, sale of fixed assets. We had about twenty or $30,000 of fixed asset sales, um, which is not something we rely upon for our budget every year because it sort of comes and goes based on what's up for sale. Um, so when I took out those sort of one-time type revenues or infrequent revenues, it brought it down pretty much in line with what we've budgeted. Uh, the, the one other thing we're being conservative on in departmental revenues that's been driving the numbers up the last couple of years is Cherry Hill has been doing really well, um, like way better than they were the prior, the, you know, pre-pandemic. And so we have been slowly increasing Cherry Hill revenues, but we're, we haven't increased them to, for example, what we received last year, because we're not sure if this is a temporary increase um, or if it's going to be a long uh, permanent increase. So Cherry Hill is one of those areas where we're being a little bit conservative. We are increasing what we're projecting for revenue based from compared to the prior year's budget, uh, but we haven't increased it all the way up to where it was last year because it's so much higher than it was the prior couple of years of experience. Uh, licenses and permits. So we brought that up significantly. Um, that's tied directly to all the development that's going on in town and, and hopefully the future development that will uh, create revenue in this category. So. 
um, we have brought that up uh, closer to what the average has been the, the last few years. Special assessments is what we collect uh, from UMass and the five colleges for PBTA uh, offsets. They, they pay a portion of our, our regional transit assessment. Uh, so that's a, we don't know that number right now. We keep the prior year's number. And what we'll do is um, we will get the exact, we'll, we'll get a, an estimate in December from the transit system that we will update this number with. So we'll have a, a better figure there. Fines and forfeits, again, that's pretty consistent with what the history has been there. FY21, there was a really large amount of uh, noise violations that were uh, collected. I don't, I don't know if it was an accounting thing or what, but um, there was a huge increase in noise violations collected that one year, um, which seems like 21 would be the year we wouldn't collect a lot of noise violations because of the pandemic. So uh, so, so that was a little bit of a, an odd thing, but it's been in line with experience. Investment income. So we've been trying to increase our investment income revenues uh, slowly over the last three years. I think when I first started, it was around 60,000. We've increased it to 90 last year. We're bringing it up to 100. Uh, you know, I'll talk to my treasurer and we'll see again what we think we're going to collect over the coming years. But we're always a little conservative with this um, because you know how quickly interest rates can change. Uh, so the investment income is what we collect on our bank accounts, uh, essentially. Uh, and 20, you'll see a big year and 20, I think was the best year we ever had. And it was because the treasurer had a whole bunch of CDs lined up that all came due in 20 uh, FY20. So all the earnings for those CDs all was re recorded at the same time. And our new treasurer is trying to outdo that year. So that's the good news is our new treasurer is trying to, is trying to beat that year. So, um, and then the last section is miscellaneous. So uh, this area has fluctuated a lot in recent years. So back in FY20, that was where strategic partnership agreement payments were held. Um, that was about $120,000. As you all may know, the town no longer gets the strategic partnership agreement payments uh, directly. We don't get those anymore, but the, the uh, university does make payments directly to the school system. So it was a little bit of a uh, switch where the town doesn't get the money. There's $200,000 that goes directly to the schools, um, new money for them, but we lost a revenue source. So, so that's one thing that's different. Um, the other thing in that area or the other big thing in that category is um, occupancy fees. So occupancy fees have fluctuated wildly in the last few years. This is the agreement we have with the hotel uh, um, on campus that they make estimate, um, they make a 7% or 6% occupancy fee, occupancy fee payment to the town. Um, and during the pandemic, we received zero. Last year, we received about $80,000, much lower than what we received in prior years. Um, and given the enrollment concerns uh, there and the sort of the space concerns, um, we've increased what we expect to receive a little bit, but we're still being cautious on that until we see the revenue numbers go up um, uh, more than where they've been. And then the last thing there that drives that number up sporadically is uh, something called um, supplemental taxes. It's when there's a, uh, a development that you that we can do a supplemental tax bill to. It's not something that happens every year. Um, it's infrequent, but when it does happen, it can be a significant amount. Um, so for example, if there was uh, a new development and we uh, valued them at one point in the year, uh, there's an opportunity for the assessor to go back and collect some supplemental taxes um, for the remainder of the year. And when they're able to do that, they th those revenues get reported here in the miscellaneous section. Um, and so, but again, that's not an every year thing. It's sporadic, so we don't typically budget it. And so that's sort of a breakdown of our, our local receipts. Thank you. Um, Bob, is your question about local receipts or about a different topic? Uh, a different topic. Let me just ask real quickly, is there any questions about the local receipts report from other members of the committee? Yes, I don't see anybody uh, raising hands at this point. Uh, go ahead then. Please. Yeah, I, I have a question about the expenditure side and it has to do with the table that you had on salaries and benefits. Um, I think it's not that one.
Is it that one, Bob? Well, there's a there's a, a table, not there, the charts. There's there's one that's detailed shown where you show the pension piece, but you don't actually break out health insurance, I don't think. It's somewhere else in the table. Was it in this presentation or was it in the I other? I think it was in the report, not necessarily okay. in the presentation. Okay. Well, well, what's your question? I'll try to pull it up. Well, the the, the, the um let me just the the question is uh, there's a chart in there that has total employee benefits, total health benefits, total retirement benefits. And what I noticed was the total retirement benefits almost doubled from 2013 to 2022, whereas everything else was you know, kind of in a reasonable range. And I'm wondering whether that's just an artifact of you know, all the changes that have been made in the retirement programs or whether that's something that we we need to keep our eye on in terms of retirement benefits kind of growing very rapidly. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Let me bring it up. And I tried to explain it a little bit last night, but this is a better opportunity to uh, be more clear. Um, let me just, I've got the report up, just trying to find that chart. Uh, it's number 11, I think, is that right? Yeah, so you're talking about this one that has the um, where the retirement benefits were 3.8, and now they're up to 7.4. That one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. Yes. So our uh, so this is one of the things that I mentioned when we were looking at the pie charts and why operating budgets have been squeezed a little bit, and that miscellaneous section of that pie chart went up substantially. Uh, so the pension system, our increase each year is somewhere between six to eight nine percent um and it's on a large number so if you take a you know pretty big percentage on a you know a large number it's a huge amount each year and so the reason this is is because in you know for many years um municipalities and communities were not hold, uh, withholding enough money from their employees uh to to cover the benefits that they promised them for their pensions um and and combine that with people living longer that there just wasn't enough money set aside. So retirement systems have been forced to have actuaries come in and basically value what those obligations are to current retirees and future retirees, how much money needs to be set aside. And then the retirement systems not only have to withhold or assess enough money to make the, the benefit payments themselves, but they have to assess money to build up a reserve so that they have enough money on hand to make uh, to, to be able to satisfy all future obligations as well. Um, it's similar to our OPEB uh, study, but it's for retiree benefits. And so when you look at our current pension assessment, uh, the majority of that pension assessment, or at least half of that pension assessment is actually for this, what they call unfunded liability um, for past uh, shortages. So this will continue for quite a while. This will continue until the system is, is uh, you know, primarily fully funded, at which they're estimating will happen around 2033 or 2034. The good news is once the system is fully funded, uh, the anticipation, at least by many municipalities, is that our pension assessment will drop significantly, um, you know, by millions of dollars potentially once we have fully funded the system. And so that's that other chart that I showed. Uh, let me go back to the the one Sonia explained. This one here. So this blue bar, this is the funding level of our pension system. And so our pension system right now is about 62% funded. As this goes up and when it gets to, you know, I'm not sure if it's exactly 100% or somewhere over 90 that they, they target, uh, when they get there, the hope is that our pension assessment will drop significantly and we will at that point only have to make the payments for sort of our, for our current retirees and no longer for the unfunded portion. Um, mm -hmm. But until that time, there will be large increases. The other thing that impacts our pension number significantly is it's, it's the, the way the assessment works is it's divvied up based on the salaries of your Hampshire County employees. So pretty much everybody in the town is Hampshire County. Uh, is a Hampshire County employee, meaning we belong to that retirement system. At the schools, it's about a 50-50 split, maybe a little bit more where the teachers and some of the administrators belong to the mass teachers retirement system. So it's a different system that we don't have to pay into directly. Um, and the rest belong to Hampshire County. So they look at the value of all those salaries and they compare it to other members, other member towns in the system like Belcher Town and I think South Hadley and, and many other communities. Um, and they divvy it up based on that. So 
our salary levels contribute to how large our pension assessment are. And if we add new Hampshire County positions, that also contributes to uh, what portion of the assessment we represent. So the point I wanted to make last night or for uh, for when we think about FY24, we're going to see our pie, our slice of that assessment grow as we add the salaries for the new Crest Department, because uh, we're adding about 10 positions there that are all Hampshire County. That's going to increase our slice of the assessment. Um, so you might see that uh, we're going to see that cost grow a little bit more than normal in FY24. Right. But the, the rate of growth, is that going to continue until we re reach that, you know, 2033 or wherever? Yeah, no, I can share. So the um, the Hampshire County Retirement System, they have a, they hold a meeting every November. Uh, all the treasurers go and they will share their um, their payment schedule or their funding schedule. And so they you can see what they're projecting. Um, the amount of money they need each year is, and you can see what the growth in the um, in the obligation is each year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it is expected to continue to grow at a pretty significant rate until it's fully funded. And the stock market makes a, a huge impact on that. So as you know, as the stock market does well, that you know the value of their assets grow, and that can help boost up their funded percentage. So they'll take a step forward, and then when we hit a recession or a crash in the stock market, you know they'll take two steps back <laughs> and they'll drop down. So, um, so it is a you know it's it feels like we're not getting closer because every time we make gains, you sort of fall back a little bit. Yeah. Well, given what happened this year in the stock market, we probably took five steps backwards. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Kathy. I think I think Lynn had her hand up before me, Andy. Uh, I'm assuming, as with most retirement systems, that when our retirees reach 65, they go on Medicare. Is that correct? For health insurance, yeah. So, but we're talking what we're talking about right now is the actual pension um, that right. they receive. But for health insurance, uh, we, um, if they're Medicare eligible, they move into Medicare, and we adopted a, a special program last year trying to reduce costs. Um, where we now incentivize, you know, we pay the penalties for people that have not moved into Medicare, we move them and we pay any penalties because it's cheaper for the town. Okay, thank you. Jesse, back to you. Okay. Um, Bob, thanks for zeroing in on some big numbers. Sean, I, I just, I had a question when you just said the teachers are in a different retirement system than Hampshire County when you that line that bob was focused on is that cost in that line no so the town does not pay we do not so the mass teachers retirement system is is state funded um so we do not pay an, a, an assessment directly for um uh M, mtrs or mass mass teachers retirement so there's so, no cost there's no cost for the teachers in that number so there's no cost for the town either. So is it over in the a school budget that we're not seeing, or is there? There's no there's no cost at all to us to to the town or the schools for mass uh, for teachers retirement. Again, there's a cost the the global us in terms of the state. They're they're paying for it through taxes and so on. Um, but there's no assessment to the town of Amherst for mass for teacher retirement, uh, the, the town or the school. Okay, and then my other question on Lynn's. Um, I'll ask it as a question, but I think it's something I saw. When people reach the age of Medicare, I we pay their Medicare share of Part B, I think, um, which was actually a pretty unusual from my years ago. Um, so we pay a wraparound coverage. We're, we're paying for benefits that's not in the core package. But I think, are we also paying the actual the part B, I, I'm getting too techie here, but it's not in that, that fee has been going up. Um, and I just, yeah. um, so, so I think, you know, our HR director would be the best one, uh, okay. Kay, who's been our HR director for forever would be the best one to speak to it. But uh, we do reimburse for, for part B. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the, the things that Amherst has does is, is we do have strong retirement benefits, both for the pension through Hampshire County and for health insurance. Um, Amherst has made a commitment to its retirees. And so uh, we do have strong retiree health insurance benefits. Yeah. So I wasn't, it's just one of the things that pushes it up faster, Lynn, even when they hit Medicare age, because that, th that has been increasing to um, cover the cost of Medicare. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, the one thing I'll just say that's, that's interesting is for retiree health insurance, um, our Medicare rates have actually stayed flat or gone down the last several years. So what's pushing up our health insurance costs are, is not the um, not the Medicare rates. It's the uh, it's the the regular PPO, HMO, Blue Cross Blue Shield rates. Yeah, it, Medicare just got a, a great breathing room as the elderly stopped having elective procedures during COVID <laughs> sure. because if if they went into the hospital, they couldn't go back to wherever. You know, it was. Just, it was like a one time people were just astonished at the drop off in oh, really? Medicare, Medicare, which isn't expected to continue. Well, um, that's I think that's worth talking about that our health insurance projections then because that's probably the biggest driver in our budget right now, uh, because we've seen a big in our, our we went through um, utilization rates uh, just a couple of days ago and the um, use is way up. For, as you can imagine, everybody who had deferred going into a hospital or getting procedures. And what's happening, what we're told is that people go in, get a procedure, find other things that they didn't address. So all those things are now piling up. And that's why they are um, projecting 8%. The range is probably going to be bigger than that. Um, we felt comfortable putting 8% in, but that actually gives me a little bit of nervousness. But this is the best information we have at this moment in time. And people were avoiding even doctors, simply doctors appointments. Yep. So yeah, there's a lot of pent up demand. It's it's pent up, and then uh, well, we don't need to go into this. It's it's a pressure point that unfortunately is coming back, and, um, and the hospitals are trying to recoup through private insurers the fact that Medicare is tight on the way it pays. I mean, we heard that with our EMT people. They said Medicare's payment for the ambulance ride does, doesn't come close to covering it. Um, not that private does either. Although that is expected to increase. Uh, that's, that's other good news is that that is supposed to increase the, the Medicare reimbursements on the ambulance side. So I just said before I wait for someone else, but when you were showing the, um, the coming year, You've gone ahead and done 10.5 for the capital allocation. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I saw. So there is a, in terms of what's available for operating budget, salaries, benefits, and everything else, um, we've gone up on capital as we talked about. I mean, I know, I realize that's a decision point that's part of our finance, financial right. guidelines, but that's what's in the charts we were looking at. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, very quickly, and then I'm actually interested in the kind of next discussion. <laughs> um, do I assume none of our employees, as active employees with the town, pay into Social Security? No. Okay, That's true. same as the state. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I want to do real quickly is that uh, we have four people in the audience, three of whom our counselors and uh, so this is not the complete public comment section but if there's anybody in the attendee group who has questions about the financial indicator report that was received last night uh, they should feel free to raise their hand and I'll uh, get them recognized because I want to uh, try and stay with themes for a bit, but we will come back to general public comment. Okay, so um, seeing none, I think the one other thing that I wanted to do for the benefit of our uh, <clears throat> resident members of the committee for uh, Bernie and uh, Matt uh, with, uh, and Bob, Last night, I don't know if you stayed on after the financial indicator and were, um, watched any of the meeting itself where we received, where we had public comment. But <clears throat> during the public comment section, uh, we had a large number of members of the teachers union uh, who came and spoke in a very uh, some very passionate um, presentations about frustrations that they have with um, 
how ne labor negotiations are proceeding. And uh, of course, labor negotiations are, uh, we don't know because we're not a party to the negotiations. So it's, uh, uh, there's nothing you can do but to project, but it would seem that in part it's available funds. You always negotiate with uh, what you project your revenue to be. We had one member of the school committee who asked a question that was not a question as much as it was a uh, suggestion that uh, more money be allocated to the schools and it not be an even amount percentage wide is across the board for each of the uh, expense pieces. And uh, there was, uh, uh, we, we uh, did not have any, any real discussion of it. There was a little bit of uh, sort of sympathetic discussion, but no real discussion of it last night. But it was uh, a, a, a substantial amount of time and a very difficult uh, uh, thing for some members of the council because uh, they're people that uh, it's natural to care about. Uh, our, our teachers who take care of uh, educating our kids. So I, I just wanted to let you know that because it's a context that is gonna uh, sort of get into some of the discussion we have going forward about the um, guidelines. Uh, so I don't know if any other members of the committee from the council side want to add to what I just said or just let it go on. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to just add, uh, uh, you know, because I didn't know whether Bob, Ernie, and um, Matt had been there, but the focus of the comments we got were on the Paris um, and on their their wage rate. It wasn't on teachers overall. Um, so we, um, and and that was the story, focusing on that entry level wage or that wage scale. So it it just was, it was, um, and my understanding is they are a subset of the larger no negotiations. So that's all, the only point I wanted to make, um, that it was a particular subgroup. Um, that's it. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, I see your hand up too. Yeah, I just wanted to note that there are some counselors in the audience that I know had particular concern um, last night or expressed that concern last night. Um, and I also wanted to note that the question came up more than once about how and when we can have this discussion. Um, and so I'm posing that to you, Andy, and maybe Lynn. Um, I've heard some mixed things like, well, it's not our business to get into because it's a contract negotiation. Um, but then I hear that uh, there are ways that we may be able to at least have a discussion about whether a larger percentage is attributed to the schools. And then I hear that even if we are to do that, we don't get to choose how the school will use that money. So there's like a lot of complexity around this. And I think particularly for new counselors, it would be really helpful for us to have an understanding of what it is that we can control, um, even if it means having a discussion that doesn't feel comfortable or that we're not, that we haven't, it hasn't been status quo, but like what discussion can we have and which pieces can we, are not ours to have and then how and when can we have those discussions? So I just appreciate a little bit of thought going into that so that we can be clear as counselors on that piece. Bernie? I'd be concerned about any attempt to do an end run around the school committee and their negotiating. Um, it's really the school committee's responsibility, hopefully with guidance from Good Labor Council, um, uh, about what, how, what and how they want to settle. So um, I'm automatically concerned when someone does an end run or, or comes to the finance committee or any, in, or to the council and says, hey, look, you know, uh, do something about this. Uh, it's really the school committee's responsibility. Um, 
Our per pupil expenditure is one of the highest in the state. I think there's only one other school district in Western Mass that comes close to matching ours. Um, that's always a factor. And school committees are authorized to spend their budgets for any lawful purpose. So if we give the school committee an extra million dollars and they decide they wanna um, take everybody to the opera, everybody goes to the opera. Um, I literally have that have that happen in Belcher Dome when you're not to the opera, but uh, uh, the, the symphony, it's Frank, uh, City Hall and it was a million dollars, but. We have a good theater decision. department. We don't need to take them anywhere, you know, just. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I, I just would be careful about uh, or cautious about uh, uh, people doing an end run. Paul? Well, yeah, so I think, Michelle, you asked the three appropriate questions, right? So what is the council's role is probably the most pivotal one. Um, you know, so this is we the um, school committees in collective bargaining with the teachers union. There's a process, well-established legal process where that, you know, they have been at it for a long time. There's processes when you don't reach an agreement, how you process that. It goes through, uh, it goes to mediation, uh, fact-finding, all the different processes. And that's where they're working their way through right now. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I worry when the council members start to make statements about um, the, you um, deservability or whatever the town's finances are, that's all admissible into these discussions. This information is public information that counselors are saying in a public meeting. So that's all available. I think it's important to know what the council's role in this situation is. And that is you are the appropriating authority for the budget. And so this, the second question is, can we give more money to the schools if you wanted to? And the answer is that's part of what your discussion is going to be about the budget guidelines is what we're how do you want to allocate the town's budget um, but the third thing you said is we don't control how the schools spend that money and that's absolutely true it's a bottom line number they get one number and they can spend it all on increases they can spend it on you know whatever it is they, they so choose um, I think it's important to recognize that there are three elected bodies you know the the trustees the, the library trustees the school committee and the um, town council and you each have different responsibilities for different things so making sure people observe what their responsibilities are um you know the the um, i would assume I, I don't, and so i don't want to assume anything actually um and then also just as we start to consider this um you know i think you, the council is important for the council to understand um how it responds to things like this because um if um there are probably, I have three, I, I have three other major negotiating teams who, if this is a successful strategy, they'll be here in front of you in no time. Every, every, every union will learn that this is the way that you influence behavior in the town of Amherst. And I think we have to be careful about that because the council has a role in terms of appropriating funds and choosing how that those funds are divided up. And whether it's, you know, I think we've been very successful at saying we're all in the team, we're dividing up the pie equally, but the council has the ability to say, we don't want to do that anymore. That's a, that's a conversation for you to have in terms of where your priorities lie. Um, that And then once that those priorities established, then we take that message from the council, we run with it, and we build our budget. Um, so when you say two and a half percent is goes to the town, that doesn't mean that every department gets two and a half percent. It means we start to dig into every department and say, what are your needs? What are your values? We, we have to do these new initiatives, how we build that in. What are we not going to do? So I think that, um, you know, everything that council does, you are high profile. You, you saw it last night. All those folks, you know, 40 whatever people were there at night last night because you matter and they want to get your attention and you give them really very compassionate attention, which is the right thing to do. Um, but in terms of how you, how you, actions you take, comments you make, um, everybody, you know, I can tell you other school, other um, departments, uh, not departments, other um, employee groups are watching this and see what happens with this because we're going to do it too. So just, I just want to just sort of like, how this all works out. So I know you know a lot of this, but I just needed to say it out loud after last night's meeting. 
Andy, can I just ask one yeah. follow up? I really appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. I just have one clarifying question. Um, so the negotiation that's occurring now and the budget that we're looking at for the future, are they separate? Can I, so one thing, Paul, you mind if I weigh in on that? So I just want to clarify the, the contract right now at the schools that's being discussed begins, began on July 1st of 2022. It was an FY23 being the first year. So what you're talking about are guidelines for 24. So, so there is a little bit of a difference in terms of, you know, your, what you're thinking about in terms of guidelines, when that would impact um, the funds the school committee would have um, available. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sean. Yeah, um, you know, it was sort of several of the points that I was making at the end of the meeting last night. Uh, again, the president members today um, weren't there, but pointing out that uh, we are in a difficult situation because we start with the revenue and which is we look at what revenue is available and then we're dividing up revenue when you get to dividing up revenue we're making decisions and if we decide to give more to one group because of a special need within that one group for the year it's got to come from somewhere else and so what is it that we're going to reduce are we reducing uh allocations for operations to other departmental areas uh, you know, within, the, within the three major groupings or what I frequently call functional areas, or do you uh, reduce capital? or what? Because uh, that's about the only thing we can really control because everything else is, is mandated expenditures. And so we have that difficulty with the schools itself, we have to recognize that there's regional schools for um, middle school and high school, and there's element, elementary schools. And uh, so, if, uh, but the, the uh, negotiations, because it's, it's a single bargaining unit, it, it's not an uh, entirely separate question. And uh, so that there's a lot of issues plus um, as I, as Paul just pointed out, um, there's the flow over to what's going to happen and other bargaining units that have compelling arguments of their own. So all of these are, are difficult issues that have to be worked through. But when we deal with the um, guidelines, we do need to think about this question, which is why it's important to have the discussion. I think the last thing I just said, uh, for disclosure purposes, you know, I'm sympathetic to teachers. My son was president of the teachers union district that he was working in, probably was president for about five years. So I know all about this process, hearing about it many times from um, that side too. But uh, you know, we have to do what's appropriate. Um, Paul? I just want to add one other thing is that, so if for the town side, we have three bargaining units that have settled, three that have not settled. So we've settled with DPW, two units at the DPW and the firefighters. And um, some of it is there a, there's a trust in terms of how we treat the, the next set of bargaining units. You know, unions often try to get what they call most favored nation status, which means they get the best deal that the town cuts with anybody else. We always resist that because everything is a standalone agreement. And we also will prioritize different things. And in, in the, in, well, you know, every, every bargaining unit can, every bargainer can do that and say, we want to put more money here versus there. And you, when you look at individual salaries, you unpack all the salary ranges and you say, this needs to be adjusted. So there's flexibility. It's not just often across the board. But I think that's um, being true to our bargaining units that have already set, settled is, is an important value for me. And so that's how we, but it doesn't preclude us having, I'm not, I'm not negotiating in public here with anybody. Obviously, um, we are always open to any proposal from any of our units. So, well, thank you. Um, 
So the reason that I um, led with this is that uh, that second page, which is on the budget priorities for the ex for the expenses side, that's really um, what the guidelines principally are dealing with because the revenue side, uh, you know, is largely spoken for already, and you know we can get into questions about. Uh, whether some portion of our reserves is needed to supplement the budget, whether we take a different view on the override question that uh, uh, the recommendation that had come yesterday was <clears throat> that we not consider an override for this year. And there was a little bit of discussion about that. But we are going to have to um, focus on the expenditure side. And uh, the, um, at the next meeting, um, I think that's really what we're going to be um, largely digging into. Um, I think that the other thing that happens in the in, that I mentioned last night on the expenditure side is that they're also what kinds of unique projects, because I think that what we've generally said is that maintaining current um, services that are relied upon by our community are important and that it's a high priority and then to the extent possible these are other things that are important that's how we tend to deal with the guideline draft and the guidelines that uh, ultimately get uh, enacted by the council uh, so those are the you know kind of the roadmap of the major decisions, I would urge you to go back and reread last year's um, guidelines and I can send them to you afterwards because I think the last year's guidelines are helpful to understand where we're gonna be going for um, this year's guidelines too. I mean, it's, a, it's been a useful uh, sort of template, if you will, to work from. So uh, that's sort of the process piece uh, that's coming next. And we really are going to have to get into those questions, um, including the one that we've had some discussion on, on each of the line items for how much goes into operating budget, how much goes into capital, um, whether um, the division is equal, uh, it's really important that you, we look at uh, the expenditure page and whether you feel comfortable with it and what else we want to say. And uh, that is the discussion that we're going to have. And today was sort of to help us get started, but not to have the discussion itself. Uh, Lynn? Um, I know we're not going to have that discussion today. Um, I'm feeling very um, concerned about even the slightest message that suggests that we would cut the town's budget, meaning we'd lose positions and how that sounds to our employees. And so I wanna just be upfront. I'm not in favor at all of changing this formula and i do not want to send a message to our employees in all levels that we are looking to cut because if we start out this budget season with that message out there we're in serious trouble and I, my sense is we are fiscally okay we may have some challenges my sense is that Sean probably can also tell you at this point whether he thinks, you know, we can fund our continue to fund the programs and the safety and so forth that we presently have. But let's not start sending a message that we're looking to cut this town's budget to raise another budget, because that means people are worried about their jobs and they should not be. I've said all I can. I'm sorry. Kathy? I, I just want to come in and emphasize 
a strong agreement with Lynn. I think in our evaluation of Paul, one of the things that many of us picked up is how multitasking our municipal employees are. We have been we are really tight on our the municipal side. And Bernie, you said we are high when we compare to per student or per resident on school spending, we are not high on the municipal side. Um, we're, 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 we're low on the municipal side. And it's, the, it's, it's been a tight budget for good reasons. Um, I'm not saying that we're necessarily, but I, I think we, we have to be focused town-wide. We've just added a Crest department um, we we've added DEI. We are we are managing with extremely tight resources. Um, so I th I think we need to be thinking townwide. And just so everyone knows, when the library comes in, one of the things the library's been doing is going to a group called Under Twenties. Under Twenty doesn't mean age. It means if you don't work twenty hours, you get no fringe benefits. Um, as their strategy for so we've we've got these budget pressures all over the town. Um, so I I think we we need to be really careful and um, do what's right for the whole town. Yeah, I have one other topic I'm going to bring up quickly and then go back to public comment so that because it is getting to five or at five, uh, Michelle. I don't think I understand what you meant, Lynn. Could you clarify? Are you saying that in order to change that, if we if that formula were to be changed, it would impact other people's jobs? Because you just, I, I know that sounds- That totally is exactly weird. what I am saying. Yes. Oh, could you just say a little bit more about that? Right. Like how that would, how that happens? When you look at a budget from a revenue standpoint, this is how much money we have. It means the moment you cut something one place or add something one place, you have to cut it from another place. And so the only way we can give money, more money to any to the schools, the library, I don't care which, it means we have to cut someplace else. So the discussion last night that was so disturbing to me was people suggesting that we should cut our municipal budget to fund our schools. Now I'm all for our schools, but I am not in favor of cutting one position from the municipal budget, not one. And, and the minute we start playing with that, that's exactly what we're gonna be having to do because we are predominantly personnel mm -hmm. and other things. Okay, but just one quick follow up to that. So is that the same as looking at our salaries across the board and making sure that they're equitable and in line with other municipalities? Like has how does the equity lens get applied across the board of all of our personnel? Do a salary study and then so, develop a plan to increase them over time if you need yeah. to or make adjustments over time and that but, is part of negotiations so sorry yeah. Lynn, just to, so that is part of negotiations mm -hmm. where you do one of the first things you do in negotiations is a salary comparison to comparable districts so i'm i'm sure that has been done um and one thing we've you know paul has committed to is periodically on the, at least on the town side and i'm not sure what the schools are doing at least on the town side doing a periodic look at the competitiveness of our salaries um to our neighboring towns to make sure that we're not falling too far behind. Uh, Northampton did something recently a few years ago where they did that and they determined that they were behind quite a bit and they made some adjustments. Um, I think we did it recently with one of our bargaining units as well. So I think there's ways to do it. And I, I, as part of collective bargaining, that's something that I think is always done. Okay. And does that apply to like the equitable, like, so I'll just be really blunt here. Um, there was one public comment that was talking about certain salaries um, in the police department, right. for example. So, yeah, so I remember that comment. I think the thing to be, uh, we just need to think about when uh, those numbers are thrown out, um, specifically with police, is that we don't know how many hours were worked to, to make those numbers. Um, and we don't know who paid 
for the, the I mean, we know the town paid, but many with the police department, many uh, hours are paid through details, meaning that an outside entity pays us to then pay them. Um, and so that, that's really private work that again, we're sort of a, we're an agency for flows through us. Um, but so, so it's just one thing to be, when those numbers are thrown out, you really have to dig a little deeper to understand um, what really their, their salary is versus maybe they worked a lot of overtime because there were a lot of details in town and nobody else wanted them. Um, so it, again, it can be a little, um, not misleading, but you just have to really dig into the numbers to know, to compare apples to apples. Okay, thank you. So my last question that I was gonna ask before turning to public comment is, um, Chris, um, I wanted to make sure that as you have constructed the budget that, uh, you've looked and feel that uh, continuation of the positions that we have created, um, it, particularly in that department, um, we'll get to fire later, but the, the um, CRESS is um, planned for, for the, for the year for the current staffing. Yep, so, so just, to give a little background how this works. So we, we start at this level where we, you know, we get a sense from you all what you're thinking in terms of allocations to the high level departments. So town, elementary schools, region, Jones Library. And then once we have a sense of that, we take what that uh, take that number and then we look at our detailed on the ground level expenses and we project it forward and see, can we fund everything we currently have within the allocation um, that is within the guidelines. So at this point, you know, until we know exactly what the number is going to be, um, you know, it's hard to say for sure, but we're, that's the plan is to fund everything we currently have next year. Um, and in addition to that, the plan is to phase fund everything we currently have next year and also start to bring in those firefighters that you mentioned, um, so that they're within the operating budget as well. Um, that, so I think one thing that, you know, can support everything that's being talked about is if we continue to focus, uh, if we if there are any revenues that come in better than expected or state aid comes in better than expected, if those increases are put into operating budgets, that will help the schools, that will help the town achieve our goals in terms of funding new positions. It'll give the schools more money to work with as well. Um, it, I think that's really where any new funds that come in need to be focused um, for at least the next year or two. So I just wanna, um... So, so that everybody understands what I'm um, getting at to make sure that my understanding is correct and that I've conveyed it to others. And then I'll uh, want to recognize Alicia has, hasn't had a chance to speak today, but then she hasn't asked to and Lynn and then uh, do public comment. But uh, CRESS, we funded initially is um, through um, grants for the purpose of one-time expenditures, capital build out of the bank center space for them and original, um, original expenditures that were not expected to be recurring and that uh, we uh, did not build salaries into grants because salaries, uh, grant, uh, grants expire. The, where we were at um, a, a, an awkward place is on the firefighters because that was funded out of ARPA funds for those four additional positions. And that um, DEI was funded by shifting previous uh, staff positions into those so that again, it was not um, anything that was based upon one-time funding so that the CRESS, there is not a concern about one-time funding having gone into it that needs to be picked up with additional expenditures, uh, that the only place that that goes is, um, is a concern is the four firefighters. So if I have that wrong, you'll speak up. And if I don't, I'll uh, recognize Alicia. Alicia? Um, thank you. I'm wondering um, how did we come up with our current budget formula and for how long have we been using it? So um, if you mean formula in terms of equal increases for departments, 
Um, Sonia, you may be best to speak to that. You've probably got the, or Andy or Sonia, you may have the best history around the finances. Um, you know, my understanding is that we've always wanted to promote collaboration among all the departments and to avoid pitting departments against each other. Um, and so when you do the same increase across the board, there's sort of a, a shared interest among all departments, um, as opposed to them having to lobby against each other for a higher increase. Well, I can, oops, well, I can say since I've been comptroller since uh, 2000, the year 2000, it has been this way. And I'm sure it was that way before. And it was always for equity to make sure everyone was getting the same percentage. And was that true across to the schools and to the library as well? Absolutely. Yep. Yes. You yeah, know, that's... Uh... When I came onto the original finance committee, which is now uh, getting close to 20 years ago, those essentially were the same that we did not. And so the percentage increase has been pretty much the same every year for that entire period that I can recall. Uh, it also allows departments to plan forward a little bit. I know when I was at the schools, you know, the two and a half percent was sort of the, the going increase in a, in a normal year. And so it allowed us to look forward and do some long range planning um, that you wouldn't be able to do if there wasn't an, you know, sort of a, a common expectation each year. So frankly, uh, the numbers that were the base have to go back to people who um, are no longer involved in town government. And no longer can be consulted because some of them are not even live anymore, I would expect. But uh, it, we'd really have to go back and look at very old budgets and try and see if we can see how far back it goes. But that's a piece of research work. Not sure that I would have spent too much time on it. So Alicia, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, and I just have a follow up question because so when we are, or so what I got is that we can we have been using this budget process and it was constructed, however much time ago, considering all of the different departments in the town. And so has there been any consideration to constructing a new process because we have new departments or do we just put the new departments into the same loop? in the old budget process or how does it work since we have new departments that didn't exist when we came up with the formula? Can I try to address that? Yeah. yeah. It's a good question. So when we talk about equal percentages, we talk about equal percentages between the libraries, the schools and the town. We don't mean equal percentages within those frames. The, the schools then divide up their budget as they see fit and then we look at our but the two and a half percent or whatever it is we get from the from the taxes and we look at our all of our budgets uh, including you know town hall budgets crest police fire and then we look at um what the salary needs are for each one of those they don't all guess get two and a half percent you know one department might have more people getting step increases so they might need more money another one might have everybody maxed out and and their salary structures change so each but each department is looked at independently and their needs are looked at independently. We as a as a town have to keep our budget under the two and a half percent that the town council allocates. So overall, each of our departments is, you know, our whole project, our whole budget will be under the two and a half percent. But within that independent individual departments might be slightly different. Yeah, and I, um... My other thought about this whole thing as I've dealt with it over the years is that do you consider other factors, outside factors um, in making this decision? I think that it's something we've always not pursued because there's um, a whole lot of difficulties in doing so. The clearest example is falling enrollment in schools and whether falling enrollment in schools should be considered in the amount that you give to schools or should you decrease the amount that you contribute to schools. You know, there's a comment made about we have one of the highest per pupil expenditures 
in the Commonwealth and certainly in the Western part of the state. Um, and that's very much true. And some of that is driven by the fact that per pupil uh, expenditure increases if you decrease the number of pupils that you have. Uh, it's just pure arithmetic. But um, then the question is, how much of it is fixed cost and how much of it is variable cost? But in the end, you know, I always answer the question that uh, we're buying quality education and that's what it's about. And uh, so I haven't ever gone down that route, but certainly it's something that I'm aware others have talked about and I've had uh, some former counselors who've uh, raised that question with me. Lynn? Just two other comments, one about the schools, and that is that, and I really garnered this from listening to the school building committee and the school committee as they set the program for the new school. And that is, we've really changed our approach to special ed in Amherst. We do a lot more in-house than we used to do. And that also means we have more paras per students than we used to be because many of the paras are in fact in the special ed area. All of that is still the school committee's responsibility. I actually really urge people to go and watch school committee discussion and watch Superintendent Morris talk about the shift in how what we've done with our schools, particularly as it relates to special ed. But the other thing is that when I say people in, you know, keeping people in town, I mean all public safety, I mean police, I mean the four, four additional fire people, I mean our commitment to CRESS. We're still in the beginning stages of this and of trying to figure out what that model is. And yet right now we know we don't have the staff we need. So, Anything else uh, that we can talk about today? Otherwise, I want to um, honor the commitment to public comment. So I see two hands up on the public comment side. Uh, actually, you're both counselors. It, as it turns out, though, I anybody who's uh, in the attendee group and wishes to be recognized, I see three now. I'm going to go in the order in which I believe that they raised hands, which would be to start with Shalini. So far, whoever's controlling can bring Shalini in. And by the way, um, I can't bring all counselors in because we would then have a quorum problem. I can only deal with this as public comment um, for that reason. Shalini, hello. Yes, thank you. Um... I really appreciated hearing um, Paul's perspective and Lynn's perspective on this. So I just wanted to make a couple of points because I was one of the people who was really moved yesterday and I still am. So I just wanted to clarify what how I'm thinking about this. So one, definitely don't want to get in the middle of negotiations between union and school committee. I think having those clear boundaries is really important as has been mentioned. Um, second, uh, I want to say we have a school committee and trusting them uh, as our elected body is really important and not trying to, you know, like say, oh, the, you know, like whatever. So we just, that in my mind, that's really important. We have an elected body and we have to publicly and anyhow support them uh, or trust them in what they're doing. The third thing is uh, there was a mention of salaries of teachers versus police and um, I just did a quick review and of course these are averages there's a lot of complexity in this information number of hours and whatnot, but at least this is just because it was brought up. Uh, seeing from the Department of Education, the teachers average salaries in Amherst Pelham was 85,000 and Amherst elementary is 80 versus Northampton is 65,000. In Pelham, it's 70. In Hadley, it was 69. Belchertown, 74. So just just so that people kind of have that sense that we are, you know, we do value. This is again, in my personal opinion, this is still low, but but just to say that as a town, we do value our education and educators, which is why we offer better salaries than our neighbors. 
Um, and police, I looked at the same and like, what is, how are we placed with the police? And the average Amherst police is 75,000, Northampton is 75 and Hadley 75. So in terms of police, we're paying the same averages. Again, this is one website more in, but just as a, I don't know, for me, it was like, okay, that's interesting that police were paying the same as our neighbors, but teachers were paying way higher. That's one thing. The other thing I wanted to say though, was it's the paras again, that um, the low salary, which I think is a values discussion. And uh, it's not again, just Amherst, it's not a school committee. It's just collectively, I think it's important for us to pause I feel it's important for us to pause and have that conversation about, and it sounds like having it in the budgets, what was that budget committee, budget guidelines? No, budget something committee, coordinating. Coordinating, coordinating committee, okay, I was reading your lips. Uh, budget coordinating committee, because I think having a, a t, uh, someone representative from the school committee would be important to give, have, be part of that conversation and figure out what to do and for that matter then maybe we need to look at the salaries throughout our and you know revisit that as a separate conversation of the lower level lower entry i don't know what the word is but salaries for that and there was just one last thing ah oh, oh yeah and again like the what i also heard was this cola and, and the cost of living but there's also steps and other increases that teachers are getting which i didn't know about and so i think just it's just to say that we really don't have information when when we hear things i think it's important for us to listen and then be able to find where is the right place to have that conversation and also to support the people who are coming to us like hey we are listening to you and here is where you need to have that conversation here is what we can do just that clarity of role and we're all speaking the same language then and and helping each other that's all thank you well thank you Shelly. um whoever's uh managing to uh should bring pam rooney in since she was next in line so that we have Pam, how you need to unmute yourself and welcome. I thank you. I, I don't think I was supposed to come in as a panelist. <laughs> um, I have a very mundane question compared to what was just asked. And that is for my benefit and for anyone else listening. Is there an actual phase called budget guideline development? Um, or is this, does this, you know, 40,000 foot perspective, uh, is that just a general discussion? And does that constitute budget guidelines? If someone wants to participate, for instance, on the 21st, is there also a form? or uh, any other venue besides just, you know, basically calling in on the Zoom call. Okay. Um, that would be great to get an answer to. <laughs> yeah, I don't, um, Sean, you've done with capital, you've- um, Yeah, do I mean it? So, so, so budget guidelines, it is an actual phase and it's a document. It's a document that the finance committee will produce and it will be brought to the council and you'll vote on it. Um, and I think what's important is on the 21st is whatever you hear on the 21st should be part of the discussion at this body, If you, especially if you hear something uh, in prevalence, if there's lots of strong comments to a certain uh, area, um, that would be something you would wanna discuss and make sure is, uh, you know, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that'll all get put into the budget guidelines um, that will be brought to the council and voted on. So the budget guidelines, it's an actual document that you vote, it's tangible, and it's something that Paul and I um, use to guide the development. So it's, it is a distinct phase. And I think in terms of, again, people can can provide input into the budget guidelines or the uh, either by giving oral comments at the hearing, they can also email, um, counselors then and that can be forwarded to the finance committee for consideration they can email paul or myself um you know they can communicate any way they'd like and in any for any format they'd like mm -hmm. oh, I, that really was 
I was going to just say, we, this is a time, and this is one reason why we make sure people know this is the time for people to be emailing us, to make public comment, to use the online submission form, to go to engage amherst.org to mention this at town count at uh, district meetings it this is the time <laughs> jeffy yeah i i just realized that counselors who just came on um the last time may not have seen the budget guideline document so what we could do andy is just share last year's you know that this was what came out last year um you know, so you would get a sense of the document that the council then goes to work on and the council can send it back. You know, it comes out as a draft. So there is a document that comes out of all of this and it, it would be posted, but I, I, we discuss it in December and the new counselors would have all been seated in January. So they weren't part of that last time around. So I just think it would be good to share it, to show what it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it was shared actually, but um, anyway, Alicia can tell us that. Alicia. I'm sorry, I have sort of a completely different question. Um, okay. <clears throat> but yeah, so I think, you know, the budget process, I mean, as going off of what Kathy said, it did happen before we were seated. Um, and I think this is one of the processes that a lot of people in town are the most interested in learning um, in terms of my observations from trying to participate last year. And I think my confusion comes from why we ask town members to provide input in the budget process if we have no intentions of changing the way that we approach the budget process. So I, oh, I can respond to that. I don't think it's that there's no intention. I think the comments, again, go to the uh, people who build the budgets and they, um, have the opportunity to reflect that in their budget proposal. Um, again, an example is, you know, there was feedback and input around CRESS um, that was ultimately put into a, a budget proposal under our current system. Um, and there's been other, you know, there's been other examples of things that have been um, discussed or put into the budget guidelines. Again, for example, the, the four firefighters was something that has been noted. Um, you know, that's where we're working through putting that into the, to the process. So I think the the feedback and the process are two different things. And I think our, our process is set up right now to solicit feedback, um, get them to the budget guidelines, and then that goes to the town manager to try to incorporate what he can. Kathy? Um, and is... so, sorry, I just have a follow-up to that. That okay. was helpful, but then I'm wondering, and so how do those two pieces work together? I mean, that along with the initial uh, formula that we use, so how do those two pieces work together? Like, do we just use the initial formula to come up with a baseline, a baseline budget, and then we're using the feedback to make small alterations? Or I'm trying to understand how those two pieces go together. Yeah. So, um, so I think we can talk. I think we should dive into this more when we talk about the guidelines next time. But based on the feedback you receive, it may influence the decisions that, uh, or influence what you put into the budget guidelines. So for example, if you get a lot of feedback um, at, the, at the forum to you know, add new positions or to increase salary levels or to do something like that, the, the, what I would translate that to is that we need to increase operating budgets. And so that could be something that goes into budget guidelines to recommend that operating budgets are increased, for example. Um, if you get feedback that the, uh, you know, vehicles are in disrepair or in bad shape or roads, more roads need to be done. That could be translated into the budget, putting into the budget guidelines that more money needs to put, be put into capital. Um, so I think we've put out sort of a baseline based on the revenues we have, but now your discussion is to he hear the feedback from the community and then look at the different levers that are in the, as Andy pointed out, really the expense side of the projection we shared, um, that's just a baseline for you guys, for you all to make recommendations against. Um, so again, that that's a starting point. And yeah, we will take, uh, you know, the feedback we receive, and then the guidelines that you all develop and adjust accordingly. Thank you. Um, just wanted to actually address one other thing that came up 
real quickly and then get back to the rest to, to the rest of you and back to there's one more public comment we need to hear um budget coordinating group came about because for a while there was this um dynamic occurring at town meeting where um advocates for say the schools would come in and make a uh, try and organize a large presentation and try and lobby within town meeting to get a larger slice of the pie at the expense of some other piece uh, municipal or whatever and uh, it was not a healthy process it was not easy being on the finance committee which was at that point a committee of the town meeting um, to have that kind of process going on on the floor of town meeting and uh, it, it was uh, in, in order to um, get around that the uh, then finance director and a couple of us on the finance committee came up with the idea of a budget coordinating group that would be representatives of each of the elected boards to try and see if we could um, address those issues in a different forum and then get unanimity so that we could have support from the school committee and the library trustees and the select board going into town meeting to not have that happen. And that, that was the history of the budget coordinating groups formation. And it sort of has just continued since since that time into our new form of government because it was incorporated into the charter. Uh, Kathy? Um, I, you know, I'm aware there's still a public comment, but I just want to make one quick uh, observation. In my time on the council, there have been not just tweaking the budget, but there have been major shifts. I mean, when, when you're talking about spending a million dollars more on something that you weren't spending anything on anymore um, within the capital budget. We have a sustainability fund. We have a building maintenance fund that didn't exist before. We've shifted. We've shifted the way we we've got a climate change goal, and we've shifted a lot of emphasis. So it's it's. Um, I talked last night about being in a box. We're in, in the box of our revenues. <laughs> But within that, I think we have been pretty remarkable as a town. Um, and that's reflected in these initial guidelines, but it's also reflected in the way the town staff goes out and gets additional grant money to support the efforts where we where we don't have enough money to do what we want to do. So the, I think the, all of these discussions have a lot of impact um, on uh, each year and over a four-year period since I came on, there's been a big shift. So I, I just want to say it's not it's not small when these are and and meanwhile there's kind of nothing we can do about health insurance, which is the thing I used to work. So there's this thing that's kind of sucking money out of us that we're not in control over. But I just so I just want to turn it back to I think this is an important period that we're in in November and December. Um, and um, the, the more input we get, because we have to make choices, and that's where we're, we're giving, if you have to make choices, put the emphasis here or there. So I think it's just really important to have that. These, these are not easy choices, given that we're in the box of our revenue. Yeah, I also, as much as it's critically important that we kick off the fiscal planning for next year in November. The reality is, as counselors, both at large and district counselors, we're listening all the time. And one of the really important things about both Michelle and Alicia pushing on this question tonight is, you know, I realize some of us have become a little too set in how do we do this so that we're having a hard time explaining it. But, you know, I'm listening to my district. I'm listening, frankly, as you know, I go to just about every district meeting I can make. And I hear 
in those districts, what's important to them? Is it sidewalks in district three? Is it the condition of roads in district two and one? It, you know, it's just all kinds of things. And, and so we bring that to the table when we start this budget discussion in November. And it's part of what shapes how we think about things throughout. And I think, Kathy, um, you really focused on the changes that we've made in the capital area, but we've made some serious and really terrific changes in the um, operating area. And it's making our town be noticed and people are looking and saying, look at what they're doing. Can we do that? So, and that's not been easily done given the constraints of the amount of money we have. But as so as we go into this period, or now that we're in this period, I just urge people to bring their, how they've been hearing for the whole last year, even as you were running for office, bring that with you to this conversation. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can we bring Tony in? Uh... Hi, Tony. Thank you for your patience. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I've missed some of the meetings, so I apologize if, I, if my comments are out of place, but I wanted to pick up on a thread that I think Michelle was getting at of uh, wage equity within and across town departments. It would be helpful if those salary studies that were mentioned could be made publicly available um, so interested parties could look at that. I don't, I don't recall seeing such a study before. When I look at the gross pay from 2021 for town staff, there were 49 employees that earned above $100,000. As Sean said, that does not translate to their base salary, as it could include overtime for road work details, etc. But it's still a very high pay. To the best of my knowledge, school employee salaries are not made publicly available and are only accessible by filing a public records request. In 2020, I filed such a request, so I have the FY19 figures for the schools. It can be a little confusing since there are separate spreadsheets for the elementary district and the regional district and the job titles are not listed. For central office staff or any staff that support both the elementary and regional districts, I have to add their salaries from each district together. Uh, still, there are some earning more than $100,000 per year. If councillors feel strongly that paraprofessional pay scales in Amherst are too low, as I do, especially when I see Popeye's fried chicken pays $18 per hour, you could communicate to the regional school committee that you would like them to review salaries and wages across the board as they work through collective bargaining, looking at the feasibility of redistributing some of the funding from the higher paid employees to the lowest paid employees, rather than trying to find a way for the town to allocate more to the schools. As you know, Amherst spends, sorry, as you know, Amherst spends a lot more per pupil in neighboring districts. And when asked why that is, the superintendent has said that we have more staff and we pay them more. Certainly we do have more staff per 100 students than other districts, but perhaps the paying more is more limited to those on the higher end of the pay scale. While I would not support giving the schools a higher percentage of the property tax levy than they receive currently, a more equitable distribution of the funding allocated to the schools, in addition to a staffing review to see if staffing levels are appropriate, could help address the pay inequality and pay power professionals a more equitable wage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tony. So with that, I think that um, we've pretty much concluded the agenda with there's one, uh, two additional things um, that I can handle very quickly if uh, you're willing. Um, one is, uh, the minutes um, we have a backlog of minutes and Kathy and I have reviewed four sets of minutes and um, made some minor changes nothing of major substance I don't know if anyone else from the committee has done those those are the first four in dates um, a b c and d so they're the minutes of May 9 May 24, May 26, and May 31st. Um, and uh, if um, we're um, somebody's comfortable, if you're comfortable with uh, moving them as um, knowing that Kathy and I have 
reviewed them and made the minor changes that we thought was appropriate. I would take a motion on that. Otherwise, um, I will send them out to the committee for future meeting. Lynn. I move that we approve the minutes for, I can get pull up the thing so I can read the dates. May, uh, 9, May 24, May 26, <coughs> May 31. As stated, thank you. <coughs> is there a second? Is, it, yeah, is there a second? It's, it's as amended. Second, Miller. Okay, so um, any discussion on that? If not, I'm gonna... Um, just quickly go through the list to get votes. Uh, Bob Hegner. Uh, support. <clears throat> Matt. Matt. Matt Holloway. You may have stepped away. Yeah, I'm going to go into support. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Said yes. Okay, count that not as a yes. Uh, let's see, uh, continuing on alphabetically, uh, Michelle Miller? Aye. Kathy? Jane. Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Alicia Walker? Yes. Uh, Lynn? Yes. And I think, did we do Bob? I think we did. So uh, it's unanimous. Um, so the, and the last thing that I was just going to um, say, mention is the um, question of next meeting and what the meeting plan is. And uh, we had scheduled um, our next meeting for the 21st, um, going on the pattern of every Tuesday following a council meeting. 22nd. Hmm? 22nd. 22nd, right, for the committee. 21st for the council, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, we did schedule an additional council meeting last night, uh, but that doesn't mean we have to schedule an extra committee meeting unless, um, there's a feeling that we could make progress on the uh, on the guidelines. Um, the disadvantage of doing that is that the uh, forum itself I believe, is on the 21st and the extra meeting doesn't, it comes before the forum. Uh, so um, as of right now, we would have essentially uh, two more meetings to do the first draft of the guidelines. And um, if there's a, um, anybody who feels that we need one additional meeting, um, this is the time to speak up because uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion, a lot of work in two meetings time. Kathy? So Andy, you're, you're saying we're meeting on the 22nd, then then we don't meet again till the 6th of December. That's correct? No. Um, go back and get my uh, list up. I had it in front of me as I was. Uh, I, I think I'm correct because. Um, you are. I am correct, right, Lynn? Yes. So I think we might need another meeting on the 29th is because if we're get a draft that we can all work on done, um, we might need to, because we have to get it then to the council. We're, we're, we're trying to get this done by January. Is that correct? I, yeah. I just, you know, so I'm just looking at uh, one meeting and then meeting again on the 6th, unless we are make, I think we need a tentative meeting on the 29th that we could always give up if we are just brilliant on the 22nd <laughs> and get so far with our discussion that we are, we've are we got a good working draft by the 6th. That's just my thought um, on, because this is coming kind of late in November. I support the idea of holding the 29th. 
and I have a little bit of self-interest because I might have to miss a piece of the meeting on the 22nd, but I do want to participate. I, I just have a, a family issue that needs me to be in New York, but I'm going to try to be there. So anyway, that would be my suggestion to yeah. And again, the only other alternative uh, that I want to yeah, I recognize, Michelle, uh, the only other alternative to consider would be having an extra meeting a week from today to begin work on it, but then it's before the forum. I think it's too soon. I mean, I think we really need to have the forum happen and uh, be looking at all of us looking at last year's draft. Um, so we come in with a framework. Yeah. Michelle? I just, I wanted to follow up with you, Andy. Um, you mentioned last night coordinating with GOL on the town manager goals. So I don't know if that's just something that you and I can talk about separately or how that plays into, I wasn't exactly sure how you envisioned that. Well, what I think is what we just like to know is what, um, the proposal is coming forward on the goals and um, that we get that incorporated. When you look at the guidelines, and I'll make sure that I get them sent out again tonight just so we don't, people don't have to go looking for them. Uh, the uh, uh, question of what, what it is that um, we want to have focused is a, has a specific section within the last few years um, guidelines and oh. we've tried in that section to say these are the highest priorities for additional things that need attention to make sure that there's coordination between these two documents but um, you know to, to a large extent we've not viewed that as a primary discussion to initiate in the finance committee we've tried to look at that as a primary issue to focus in the committee that's working on the manager goals got it okay thank you so um i think that what's most important than what you just asked and i appreciate you asking it is the timeline of when you think there'll be sufficient progress on the goals that you can provide guidance in your dual role as a member, as chair of that committee and a member of this committee, you're in an ideal position to um, provide us that guidance and you have to tell us when you can do so. Okay, thank you. I will, I will, I will look at the calendars and then I'll coordinate with you and get back to you. Okay. So we're leaving it that we're not scheduling a next meeting for next week and uh, so that we all know what the schedule is. That said, um, any other, I have no un unanticipated business to bring up. Any, anybody else has things that they didn't anticipate? Otherwise, I think- we're Well, we are holding the 29th, is that correct? Yes, the okay. request is to hold the 29th as an additional possible date and to recognize that um, the 22nd is the next scheduled meeting and we're holding the 29th additional. I assume that's agreed. So that said, I think uh, I can declare that the uh, Finance Committee meeting of uh, November 8th is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.